The First Lutheran. I'm Pastor Jeff Johnson. I'm welcoming you to but another wonderful um, Lenten luncheon here at First Lutheran. Uh, I'd like to give our ladies a big hand for the great meal that we've had today. Um, we have two more Lenten luncheons after this one. Next week, um, Police Chief Mike Williams will be here speaking. Fire Chief, I do that, forgive me. So, so Fire Chief Mike Williams will be here, so please forgive me and beforehand, um, Fire Chief Williams. And our last week, we have um, an iconographer, uh, that's a person who does is an expert in religious pictures um, um, from the New England Synod. She's going to be here presenting um, on that, which is sort of a fascinating um, ancient art form that has come back into vogue, um, um, not only for artistic reasons, but also for religious reasons in the last, say, 20 years. So it's really kind of cool. So we're, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so we have two more after that, but today is about today. Um, and before I talk about that, why don't we have a quick word of grace. Gracious God, thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you that we're all here safely and soundly. And thank you for this wonderful meal um, and this fascinating lecture about um, the life of our forebearers here in Brockton. Um, be with those who have nothing to eat tonight or nowhere to lay their heads and bless the food that we are about to eat to the nourishment of our bodies. All this we ask through your name that is holy. Amen. Um, our speakers today are um, um, Nicole Casper, who is the Director of Archives at Stonehill College. She, she also teaches and she's been here before and uh, she's an expert on the Strand fi uh, Theater Fire, which celebrates, well not commemorates something today. Um, earlier today, and Jim and she can speak to you about that too. Um, because she and Jim co-authored that book about the Strand Theater of Fire. And um, they're both speaking today about um, the Brockton tragedy at Moosehead Lake. And um, Jim told me about this project roughly a year ago. And I'm going to let them speak to you about it. There are some wonderful displays here that are very cool. So I invite you to look around afterwards. Um, at things. The book is released in May, however, and they'll talk more about that. Um, there are some Strand Theater Fire books over here, so take a look at those, please. There's lots of visuals, and I'm sure lots of opportunity for questions. So, without any further ado, Mr. Jim Benson, who's the administrator here, and Nicole Casper. Good afternoon, and uh, different to be on this side of the uh, agenda, so uh, no jokes today. Uh, but uh, we're happy to see so many people here, and as Pastor alluded to, we uh, do have some competition today, uh, and that is earlier this morning, uh, the commemoration of the 77th anniversary of the Strand Theater Fire took place and they are now having uh, lunch at the uh, Union Hall down the street. So uh, some people that would have been here are down there, but uh, we're glad to see so many people here today. Uh, the Strand Theater Fire was the second greatest disaster in the city of Brockton behind the Grover Shoe Factory Fire, which also celebrates its anniversary in March, March 20th, will be the uh, anniversary of the Grover, which occurred in 1905. And we're here today to talk about the third largest disaster in the city's history, one that occurred 90 years ago, May 13th, and has largely been forgotten, and that's the tragedy at Moosehead Lake. Uh, May 13th, uh, 1928, was Mother's Day. It was a Sunday when the call came to Brockton to uh, a group of guys that for years had gone to Moosehead Lake fishing in the spring, that the ice had gone out of the lake. Uh, they got that call on Saturday at 4.30 Sunday morning. Three vehicles and uh, 10 guys were on their way to uh, Moosehead Lake. <clears throat> they arrived uh, sometime, uh, depending which 
newspaper report you look at, uh, but definitely by about 5 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, made way uh, up the lake in uh, the Mac 2, which uh, is in the picture here to my left. And about 16 miles up the lake, the boat uh, began taking on water, sank rapidly, bringing uh, nine of the Brocktonians and their main guide to a watery grave with one survivor. Those killed were ex-Mayor Harry C. Howard. Uh, Mayor Howard had been part of his father's large construction company. Uh, and those of you familiar with Brockton, uh, his firm built Barristers Hall on Main Street as well as uh, First Baptist Church at the corner of uh, Warren Avenue and uh, West Street. Uh, Fire Chief William Daly, who had been a firefighter at the Grover disaster, he perished, as did city physician Arthur Peterson, Highway Commissioner G. Fred Dahlberg uh, of uh, the F Dahlberg Funeral Home. He and his brother and father were owners in the Dahlberg Funeral Home, as well as plumbing, hardware, and roofing business. And their business was located in the building where the Cape Cod Cafe is today. And uh, Plymouth County Sheriff Earl Blake. Blake was a uh, native Brocktonian, uh, industrialist. Uh, John Sandberg, owner of the Brockton Tool Company, which was on uh, Belmont Street near uh, what's today the Conley Funeral Home. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Sandberg Home, which was one of the uh, grandest in the city at the time on Copeland Street. Uh, Today it's a big white stucco house with a red tile roof with a uh, white fence around it. Uh, Sandberg entertained Swedish royalty twice in that house. Uh, businessman Knut Salander, who owned the Shepherd Market, which uh, some of you remember because it was in existence into the 60s right up the street. Uh, Dr. David Bridgewood, who was an MD and a prominent eye specialist in the city and Dr. Frank Moberg, a uh, dentist also here in the city, and both uh, Fred Dahlberg and Dr. Moberg were members here at First Lutheran Church. Uh, additionally, uh, Samuel Budden, the main guide and boat captain, also perished. The sole survivor of the event was Captain James Lays, who was captain of the Brockton Police Department and a former city marshal and uh, it was the recovery effort took over a month before the last body was recovered. Dr. Moberg was the last body to be recovered from the lake and uh, this uh, story has uh, been part of my life probably for almost all of it because I grew up hearing about it from grandparents who knew some of those that were lost as well as uh, their children and uh, so it's kind of uh, been in the background of my mind and back in uh, well 17 years ago now so 2000 2001 when uh, Lloyd Thompson and I and Lloyd's up at the back there we partnered up to do our first book The Swedes of Greater Brockton and we included this in the Swedes of Greater Brockton. At the time I said to Lloyd maybe we should have should do this, but we chose to do the Swedes in general. Uh, had an opportunity at that time to meet the daughter of Fred Dahlberg and uh, share with her what it was like growing up uh, losing your uh, father in this type of uh, an event. So it's kind of been in the back of my mind that this needed to be put into print, put into a book so that it gets remembered and uh, have been going back and forth with it for several years and other books have come up in between and uh, I had the opportunity to contact uh, Elizabeth Lays who is the grand only surviving granddaughter of Captain Lays and she's now uh, 92 or 93 lives over in Easton and uh, for the last four years, every once in a while, my phone will ring and it will be her. And have you done the book yet? She says, I'm getting old. <laughs> so she's very happy to know that it's uh, almost done. And 
The one thing she said to me the very first time I talked to her, she said, whatever you do, do not say in the book that my grandfather was fat. She said he was fit, and when you see pictures of him, he was. He's the gentleman standing in the picture over there, and uh, he's with Chief Daly, who perished, who's seated. She said, everybody said the only reason he survived was because he was fat. She said he was in better shape than all the rest. So, uh, and uh, we hope that when the book comes out in May, and we'll talk more about that later, that she will... Uh, be with us. Uh, this, uh, as you can see by the display to my right, uh, this made news around the country. Uh, it's amazing that uh, newspapers, not only from Brockton, Boston, but here on these boards are newspapers from Atlanta, Georgia, Little Rock, Arkansas, Washington, D.C., New Orleans, San Francisco, Omaha, Nebraska, Richmond, Virginia, Tampa, Florida, and more carried the story. There were more articles displayed right there on this event than there were on the Strand Theater, uh, which was a much bigger uh, loss of life and uh, at a time when communications was uh, more advanced. Uh, when you read uh, a lot of the articles, a lot of the articles in the Enterprise, names changed, names are misspelled, information was coming on a very primitive phone system out of the North Main woods, um, and uh, people were driving up there, people were flying up there, some bodies were flown home, some were driven home, some were sent home by train. Um, it's, uh, the information gathered is amazing. We had, uh, you know, you never know what to expect on Facebook. And when it first went out on Facebook that this book was coming out, somebody in Brockton posted a copy of a Brockton Enterprise article and says, why do you need a book? Here's the whole story right here. And it, uh, only a very little part of what uh, we've been able to uncover in the whole thing and uh, the amount of effort that went into the recovery, as you can see by the headline, search offered by Governor of Maine. Uh, the mayor of Brockton, uh, Harold Bent at the time, told the governor, spare no expense. And uh, everybody was uh, involved in trying to bring home the bodies of these men. Uh, people volunteered from all over. Uh, just one group uh, to bring to your attention because it's kind of interesting that so many were involved was they called for divers to go up to try to locate the bodies. One of the divers was Walter McLaren, who was a Brockton firefighter, and he was a, di a diver who had been involved in the 1904 uh, attempted rescue and, re and search effort when the General Slocum, a steamship sunk in New York uh, Harbor. The boat went down with 1,021 passengers, most of them women and children from St. Mark's Lutheran Church in the city's heavily German Lower East Side. The Slocum caught fire, sank, bringing over 700 to a watery grave, and it, up until 9-11, it was the largest loss of life in the United States not due to weather or war. Uh, another diver that offered his services was Thomas Eddy. He was famous for five months previous. He tried to rescue the 40 uh, sailors that were trapped on the S-4 submarine off the Cape that had been struck by a Coast Guard uh, boat that was on rum patrol. He eventually received uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor for uh, his efforts to save those sailors. And maybe one of the most interesting was a skilled main diver, a deep sea diver from Kennebunkport, Bickford Brooks. As he was preparing to leave home for Moosehead, reporters gathered at his house to question him. And in a typical Maine fashion, he replied, I'm pretty busy. You might want to talk to my wife over there in the car. She's driving up through the night. I don't drive a car myself. And uh, so, uh, but everything that he did, uh, how they tried to uh, work to recover the bodies, uh, and the hundreds of people from the state of Maine uh, that uh, also worked 
uh, to help bring these people home, uh, the Maine Warden Service, the Forestry Service, the State Police. Um, it uh, is just amazing to see how everyone came uh, together. And at this point, I will turn the podium over to uh, my co-author, Nicole, uh, who has uh, been great to work with, same as she was on the Strand Book. It's been uh, fun, it's been interesting, and uh, yes, there is a book. It's uh, actually, the proof is right here. Uh, we have to have all corrections in by Tuesday, and it goes to print sometime next week. So uh, I will... Uh, I'll let you hear from Nicole. But I'm not done. I'll be back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so as Jim said, um, I was co-author again on this book. And I, had, as with The Strand, my knowledge was weak at best, at being from Rhode Island originally. Um, but I first heard, Jim actually came to me in 2013 um, about the Moosehead um, tragedy. He had brought the big... Um, bound volumes of the Enterprise and asked Stonehill if we could possibly do some digitization and of those pages that related to the Moosehead tragedy, which we did. And then last year he came up to me and he, after we had the success with The Strand, he was like, so what would you think about you and Moosehead? And I'm like, remind me what Moosehead is again? <laughs> and so we talked back and forth this year marks the 90th anniversary, so we really knew that we wanted to try to write it. Of course, it was July when we decided to do this, and usually you give yourself a little bit more than a couple of months to write a draft. But we thought we were good because we would just self-publish it, so we were going to be all set. And then I read our contract from History Press, who published the Strand Theater. It's very important to read your contracts. Because it actually says in our contract that we have to give them first refusal um, of any new books we do within 24 months. So that meant a very hurried call to History Press to say, we're thinking of doing this book. We just want to give you first refusal. And they're like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, we can do that. Can you have a draft by September? It's July. Now, we spent over a year researching the Strand. Um, so now we were hurriedly um, searching. Challenges is this book versus The Strand. No one's alive, really, um, that remembers the tragedy. There are not a huge amount of photos. Um, we were very lucky with The Strand book. We had all of the Bow uh, Stanley Bowman's photos that we were able to use. So it was very easy to get photos for that, that, that collection. Luckily, Jim had a lot of postcards. He had spent years kind of, you know, on and off researching this book. Um, so we were able to get the requisite um, 60 photographs that are required for the manuscript. However, this will be the last book I have a September deadline with because I've now given up two summers writing books. <laughs> um, it was an interesting story for me to, to read, um, to write. My husband would like me to write a story not about death the next time, although I keep telling him tragedy is what people like to read. But um, so it was. It was an interesting story. It has. It really affected two two places where the Strand was really Brockton, and it got, as Jim said, it got press outside. And this one really affected both Maine and Brockton. They didn't have the communications, so people didn't know. One of the widows um, didn't hear until Monday night um, that her husband, she had gone on with her day. She lived in, it was um, Sheriff Blake's wife who was down in Plymouth. So she didn't have the same communication as the, the others did. Um, so that, it kind of shows and the biggest challenge was again the newspapers. You'll see as we in the in the book, you'll notice that it's, it says this newspaper said this and this newspaper said that because we couldn't figure out a consensus, so we just had to quote and say, "But this is what we think." <laughs> um, so for those, um, it is an important story. 
it's interesting. I've told a lot of people about this book. Um, I gave a talk at Stonehill the other day about the Ames family and the shovels, and then I mentioned this book coming out, and several people came up to me later, and they're like, I've never heard of that before, and I've lived in Brockton all my life. And so I think it goes back to, for me, as a public historian, as an archivist who takes care of history, how important it is to remember history um, and remember stories and um, so that we can look in the future, tell the story of the fact that, and dispel rumors that the only reason that Captain Lee survived was because he was heavy set, versus, you know, he was just the one who was lucky enough to survive the hypothermia of falling, you know, of having to swim in a ice cold lake. Um, so it was a pleasure to work with Jim again. It's, you know, always fun. Um, this one was a little rushed. Um, as Jim said, the book is pu being published. It will be, the book launch will be May 5th. The book officially goes on to Amazon on May 8th. So, and I'll let Jim tell of what we're going to be doing um, on May 5th to honor those who were lost. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, there are a lot of things uh, happening. Uh, the Brockton Historical Society uh, has decided uh, that uh, a memorial to uh, those who uh, died, to the survivor, and to all those who helped with the recovery uh, will be placed up at the uh, Historical Society and uh, to uh, help facilitate that uh, memorial. Uh, this coming Monday night you have coupons on your table. Uh, the Society's having a pizza night uh, over at the Cape Cod Cafe and uh, the generosity of the Jamulis family that anything uh, you spend between four and nine at the Cod, 15 percent, will uh, come back to the society to go to help pay for uh, the memorial. Uh, right now it uh, is still in the final design stage, but it will be a uh, fairly large uh, granite monument with uh, the names uh, engraved as well as a brief uh, history of the event and will be placed uh, in close proximity to the fire museum where uh, that photo of uh, Captain Lays and Chief Daly is and where we will have other displays. Um, right now we uh, are soliciting funds if anybody wants to uh, donate to it. Uh, we have a uh, anonymous challenge grant that's been made uh, for anything that we bring in between March 1st and March 31st. We have a member of the community that will match up to $1,000. So uh, that is uh, greatly appreciated, and as Nicole said, the book's going to be released on May 5th. We're having the dedication of the memorial that morning at 11 a.m., and uh, followed by a uh, light lunch and beverages, and our uh, hope is that Captain Lay's granddaughter will be the one that does the unveiling of the memorial. and. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier that we were also fortunate in the book uh, and hope that he will join us in Brockton on that day. Uh, the foreword of the book is written by Colonel Joel Wilkinson, who is the current chief of the Maine Warden Service. Uh, he wrote a fantastic uh, foreword and great that uh, he wrote it because Moosehead Lake was his area that he covered as a game warden before he became the uh, Chief of the uh, Warden Service, and uh, I see uh, our second Vice President of the Historical Society sneaking in the back of the room, uh, Chief Galligan, who I know has been tied up with the Strand Memorial this morning, so welcome, Chief. And uh, for those of you who can't make May 5th book signing uh, an opportunity, uh, if you're adventurous, from 2 to 5 on May 26th, we're signing books at uh, Greenville, Maine. And the next afternoon, Sunday, May 27th, that's a time to be announced. We're doing it at the Forks, Maine. So, uh, but I think we'll probably be doing it at the Historical Society on May 20th as well. But uh, 
word will be out, things will be out, so uh, we uh, hope to see you Monday night at the Cape Cod Cafe, and uh, are there any questions for either one of us? Rick. They departed from Greenville from the east coast at the lower end of the lake. And for those of you not familiar with Moosehead Lake, it is the largest lake in the United States east of the Mississippi contained within one state. Uh, it's 40 miles long and approximately 20 miles wide at its widest. Uh, and uh, the boat, the Mac 2, uh, goes back to what Nicole said about uh, what you can believe and what you can't believe. Uh, there are places where it says it was 42 feet. There are places where it says it was 37 feet. Uh, it was a speedboat. Uh, it was only seven feet wide uh, and known as the fastest boat on the lake. Uh, top speed of, I believe it was about 35 miles an hour, and uh, there were various uh, theories as to why it sank, that uh, it had just gone in the water and the uh, weight of the guys in the boat pushed it too far down where the seams up above the water line hadn't uh, sealed and water came in. Uh, other theories are that uh, According to uh, some newspaper accounts, old timers in the Moosehead area said that they had never seen the lake as stormy or as churned up as it was, and that the guys shifted at one point to one side of the boat where it just took in water. So uh, there are a lot of theories out there. Uh, but the uh, boat was found. It was brought up by anybody who's been up to Moosehead. You have probably seen the uh, steamship Katahdin that's still uh, in service up there. The Katahdin raised this boat from the bottom. There were no holes in it. It was repaired and uh, renamed the Wee and continued in service on the lake into the 1950s. Any other questions? Janet. I remember my parents talking about this, and, and uh, these gentlemen who died were very prominent in Brockton. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it seems that their legacy went on for a long time because of that, because mm. they were well known figures. Yeah, it, uh, they were very prominent, and that's another thing that came up. In <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all.